Hey guys, my science here, and today I am back for day number nine of R slash Pro Revenge. Where today I have three stories lined up. I honestly, again, I'm trying to pick stories of reasonable length, but the further I go, in, the further we go into this, the longer the stories seem to get. And by the end of it, I'm going to be reading one story over f several episodes or something like that. <laughs> Which would not be that bad of a thing. <laughs> but let's start off right in the middle. Not my revenge, but my professor's ag professor against cheaters. I took the final for an engineering class this morning. Usually one or two people will go to the bathroom during class. However, for totally unknown reasons, about half the class needed to use the restroom during the exam. Obviously a vast majority of them were looking at the answers on their phone. Uh, this irritated me, but I just stayed focused and barely finished since it was a hard exam. I remember that there was one particular problem that was rarely related to the stuff we went over in class, where, where part A was fairly easy, but I had no idea on how to do part B. I didn't fret over it too much though, since that part was only 5 points out of 100. Well, a professor who is on the older side and I would have thought what were for, would have thought what somewhat ignorant of technology sent us an email just just now explaining his diabolical plan to catch cheaters. Most of the students in this class use Chegg, a website that has answers to lots of homework questions. If you're not familiar, to f to be fair, I have an account too, though I only use it for studying and checking homework solutions. Anyway, he explained that he was tired of people going to the bathroom and looking up answers on their phones, so he made the question I mentioned earlier as a trap. He personally made part B impossible to solve, and about a month before the final, he got a TA with a Chegg account to ask the exact question, which was distinctly worded to be unique. He then created his own Chegg account and answered the question with a bullshit solution that seemed right at first glance, but it's actually fundamentally flawed and very unlikely that someone would make the same assumptions and mistakes independently. He said that out of 99 exams, 14 of them fell for the trap, and that everyone who had used his wrong solution on their exam was given a zero, and reported to the university for violating the academic honor pledge they signed on the front. He also sent an email to all the other professors in our department giving them the list of cheaters. Edit, edit. I forgot to mention he gave me full credit on part B of the question to... He gave full credit on part B of the question to everyone else. So yeah, uh, I don't know the professor personally since the class he taught is not part of my program's curriculum, so I won't put anyone in touch with him or anyone else who knows about the real incident and could expose his identity. Before anyone reports this for being fake, I will stress, I will once again stress that while I changed the details, the actual events played out in a similar way and the real professor did in fact get his revenge on the cheaters. That's the thing with stories like these. You don't know if it's fake, you don't know if it's real, it could be a mix of both. Like, that's, that's the dumb part of it. And also, I love how the teacher gave a bullshit answer that would make sense to a question that was actually impossible, and, like, those that didn't cheat got the full marks for the question because he, he put an impossible question. <laughs> okay, let's move on to the next one. Hippity boppity, you damaged my property. Bippity boppity, I'm calling the coppity. Bippity boppity boo, they're taking your kids too. <laughs> I just wanted to do that because that is a good Cinderella reference. <laughs> I apologize in advance for the length. TLDR at the end. This happened shortly after college. My mum is a retired disabled woman who now owns her house on a quiet residential cul-de-sac. She has lived there longer than anyone else. Her neighborhood has designated parking spaces at the end of the cul-de-sac, all with the addresses of each house painted in the parking space. My mum doesn't get out much, so I use her designated parking space 
At the time, we lived in the same city, and I visited her weekly to bring groceries, fix broken things, cook for her, etc. My mum parked her car in the backyard of her house since she went out so little. <coughs> mum kept busy by guarding or baking slash buying cookies for the children on the street. Mum's neighbour, Ivy. That's, uh, Ivy's a really cool name. And never parked well. Whenever I stopped by, her car was always parked so close to my car that I had to park on the curb. I wouldn't have cared about Ivy's piss poor parking, but for two things. She had a, she had four or five kids and had parties almost every weekend, leaving trash in mum's yards. I loved my car. A 2006 metallic ice blue Dodge Challenger Hellcat. Ooh, that's a really nice car. <laughs> the first car I had ever purchased brand new. I washed that car once a week, detailed the interior, and had rules against eating, drinking, or even leaving trash in my car. <clears throat> it was my pride and joy. Mum had called the police throughout Ivy's residence, residence because of the parties. Ivy's guests would fill up the cul de sac with their cars, obstructing traffic and getting into loud drunk fights at, at and after midnight. I often found empty beer bottles, empty condom wrappers, cigarette butts, and empty and crack baggies on the fence between the properties, mostly on either side, side of the fence. This is all important information. One Saturday while having dinner at Mum's house, I heard a loud crash and my car alarm went off. I ran outside to see Ivy's older model Honda Accord back out of her parking space and speed down the street. Ivy's Accord had a dent from the front bumper to the door and the headlight had popped out. I approached my challenger with trepidation and screamed in anguish at what I saw. My car, my beautiful three week old car with less than 500 miles on it had a dent stretching from the passenger door to the front bumper and the right front wheel was tilted at a 30 degree angle. I was livid and in anguish as I called the police, filed an online claim with my insurance and arranged for a tow truck to take my damaged car to the dealership. The estimated cost of repairs came out to uh, 3400 $3, US dollars. Total cost of repairs was eventually 6500 US dollars. I had a low insurance deductible. 100 US dollars, but my car was parked and Ivy owed for the damages. For two weeks, I knocked on Ivy's door or waited for her to come home. She stopped driving her damaged Accord and either rented or borrowed a Ford Fusion. When she, came, when she was home, she didn't answer the door. When she wasn't, she'd stay away until my rental car, a Dodge Charger, left Mum's parking space. I left a note on Ivy's door for her to call me but only received harassing calls from restricted phone numbers or people blaring air horns in my ear when I answered. Fuck you. If you're gonna do that, you, you're just as bad as when Bart did that, uh, the megaphone thing. <laughs> the revenge. About two weeks after the incident, Ivy's children came to Mum's house for some cookies. I noticed that two of them had bruises around their eyes. If Ivy hadn't hit my car, I still would have done what I did, but maybe not as underhandedly. I had mum take pictures with and of the children, but waited until the next party to strike. Ivy had a party that night or the night after. Mum called me to let me know, and I installed an app into my phone that gave me a fake phone number. I called 911 and reported the party. There's a loud party at 1007. Mountain Drive, and I'm worried because the children are around all these drunk adults. Please hurry. My mum called to let me know the police had arrived. I drove to her house, stopping by the grocery store first, so that so that appeared to be the reason. Uh, and I and saw Ivy and her boyfriend Bane already sitting in the back of a squad car from a used cast that night. I found out that Bane had warrants out for his arrest. 
Initially, the charges were disorderly conduct, conduct and disturbing the peace. However, Mum turned over the photos of the children, anonymously mailing them through the post office with Ivy's address and name as the return address. Less than a week later, Ivy and Bain were charged with child abuse charges. I think Bain was charged with more severe charges as well for abusing Ivy's daughter. Either way, the children ended up in foster care, and Ivy and Bain ended up in prison. Got him. <laughs> TLDR, my car was hit by such a foul witch. Being a pro, I played the snitch. Her children had bruises. She had no excuses. My plan went, well, no hitch. <laughs> I love how you're rhyming on this one. <laughs> and Jump like a BBC boy. I love your rhyming. It is just top-notch rhyming. Also, reading that, Ivy just like reminded me of Ivy from uh, Total Drama World Tour and how wacky she could be. <laughs> um, I'm pretty sure that might be why you chose that name for the, the character. For mum's neighbor, for your mum's neighbor, and also Bade, just I don't even need to say what that reminds me of because it's just the most infamous shot from Batman. <laughs> just and I and Bade apparently did punch uh, Ivy's daughter, so yep. <laughs> I don't know what I can say to make that right. <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> Killed a tow company with one single phone call. I'm mobile, so bear with me. Several years back, I went to work for a towing company. It's about all I know how to do other than paint cars, which is drastically affecting my health. The pay was decent, but we had to share trucks, and the boss felt that... He knew where we needed to sit in order to get the best calls. This is important for later. Several months in, I realized that I was not making the type of money that I should be making. So I took the opportunity while I was sitting in a parking lot one evening to research, start researching the laws pertaining to employees in similar situations. He was kind of an asshole, and the trucks had transponders so that he could see if we had them idling with the air conditioner on on a hot day, or idling with the heat on, on a cold day. He was always calling complaining about something if the wheels were not turning. During my research, I discovered that if he was requiring us to sit in a certain parking lot, street, or any location of his choosing, then we were entitled to be paid an hourly wage, not just our commission. The technical term was, engaged to wait. However, if he allowed us to freely roam while we waited for calls, we were not entitled to hourly wages and we were therefore considered waiting to be engaged. I never mentioned this to him, but I did start taking note of my time. Another month or so goes by and he decided to start coming down on me for tiny little BS things that ordinarily wouldn't even matter. Such as, I forgot a pop can in the cup holder. He actually had a scream fit about that. At this point, I was tired of working there and had already found another job, so I decided it was time to put my plan into motion. I called them up, told them that we needed to have a conversation about my final wages and that we could meet at his convenience. Upon entering the office, I laid out my argument, explained the state law, and told him I expected to be paid for the hours that I was on the clock, but not freely allowed to roam looking for work, or be able to do things of my choosing. He told me in no uncertain terms, I would not be paid for that time, as that was agreed to upon my employment. I did not bother to argue, as I already had my next step planned, so I took my file check and I left. The following Monday, I made a phone call to the State Labour Board, where I laid out my case to them. Needless to say, they were very interested in what was going on. And in the end, they came to review his employment records and speak to the driver still working. 
when he got the bill of of what he had to say, of what he had to pay us all, it was too much for him to afford. So he sold the trucks, his boat, and a and lot, and went out of business. I never got the only money owed to me in full, only a fraction. But the satisfaction of knowing the law just a little bit better than he did, and watching it all burn was pure bliss. TLDR, boss fucks us on legally entitled wages. I sink his company with one phone call. It's just like, hello? Yeah, this, my old boss just basically wasn't paying me because I was entitled, like my work was entitled to wait. <laughs> and that's all it took. Just that and the, he was dead. <laughs> It was dead. <laughs> Anyways, links will be in the description to my main channel and also the second channel that you're on right now with links to the playlist and the last episode. Go check them out. Don't forget to subscribe and hit the notification bell so you know when the next video comes out. A ding, a ding. And the Mad Scientist, Mad Scientist out.